Hello, everyone. My name is Sherry Mayhew, and I am the Resource Centre Director for Eastern Ontario with Hunting and Society of Canada. It is my honour to introduce our next guest speaker, Olivia Mann. Olivia will be presenting her session on speech, language, and swallowing in Huntington disease. Olivia is a speech and language pathologist with 10 years experience working with all ages, including premature infants learning to feed, kids with articulation and language impairments, patients with voice difficulties, transgendered voice, adults with brain injury and neurological disorders, and swallowing and communication difficult, uh, deficits in the hospital. Currently, she is working as a professional practice leader at Grand River Hospital, caring for patients in the ICU and rehabilitation who require treatment of swallowing and language after stroke, COVID, and neurological disorders. In her spare time, she enjoys acting and singing in theatre productions. This instructive session will educate individuals affected by HD and caregivers alike on speech, language, and speaking <coughs> experiences and best practices. You will learn about and view normal and impaired swallowing and what this means for mealtime, how medication can affect swallowing, speech language changes in HD, and general state swallowing guidelines for mealtime. This presentation will help you manage expectations, adapt to speech following changes, and ensure mealtime is safe but enjoyable and appetizing. I believe I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Would you mind just muting yourself? Thank you. A couple of housekeeping items to start. Please keep yourself muted during the presentation. There will be a question uh, and answer session at the end. So please raise your hand and unmute when you're called upon. We will also be taking questions in the question and answer tab on the right hand side if you don't want to ask your question verbally. Like all of us, I am eager to learn. So Olivia, the screen is all yours. Thank you so much, Sherry. I'm very honored to be able to uh, speak with everybody today at this conference. Um, thank you for the lovely introduction. And today we are going to look at speech language and swallowing in Huntington's disease. So I don't even have to do my introduction. Uh, I have many hats, as you've heard from Sherry. Um, I do work with a lot of folks with neurodegenerative disorders like Parkinson's and Huntington's. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit today about about how communication and swallowing affect Huntington's disease and how these uh, aspects change over time as well. So a few disclaimers, um, all opinions are my own and don't uh, reflect my employers. This presentation is definitely not intended to be medical advice. Um, always listen to your medical team and whoever your speech language pathologist, if you have one is, uh, they will be your experts. I have no endorsements or any items or services for sale or any personal or financial relationships. Um, and please contact me directly if you'd like to reproduce any part of this presentation. So our learning objectives today, it keeps me on task, are to learn how can communication be affected by Huntington's disease? What is a typical, or some people like to call it average or normal swallow? How is swallowing affected by Huntington's disease? And how can we make swallowing safer or how can we help swallowing and communication in Huntington's disease? Again, as a general overview and not um, as a replacement for your medical team. So what is a speech language pathologist? I will say here, I absolutely despise our name. It does not reflect what we do. We should be something like a speech language upper respiratory neuro specialist um, because we walk into a patient's room, especially at the hospital. Hi, I'm a speech language pathologist. And the person usually says, I can speak just fine. <laughs> so um, this is great for me personally in that I can explain a little bit about what we do. We work with kids in, in schools with lisps, we work in hospitals, we work in the community, community um, in people's homes, in retirement homes and long-term care homes, we work as consultants, uh, and we assess, treat, and educate communication and swallowing difficulties 
with patients and their families and with our interdisciplinary teams, I should add that as well. So again, as Sherry said, our scope goes from premature babies who are learning to feed for the first time all the way up until uh, supporting people with end of life needs and decisions as well. So what makes a good communicator? So we take a breath, we use our intracostal muscles in our diaphragm to fill our lungs with air, and then we use those diaphragm and intracostal muscles to expel air. And as our air is coming through our voice box or our laryngeal structure, which has our vocal folds, our vocal folds vibrate and out comes sound through our mouth and our teeth, our tongue, our lips, our cheeks, um, and our throat all move in order to make all the different sounds that we have in whatever language you speak. So tons of different phonemes created. So not only that, so that sound is made and, and it goes out into space, into the air. And as that sound comes out, it creates sound waves and reaches whoever we're talking to, it reaches your ears. Um, there's all different other aspects that also affect communication. So making the sound, making the words, our prosody and intonation, so our pitch and our loudness really affect what we're saying. So if I say, hi, my name is Olivia. Hi, my name is Olivia. Hi, my name is Olivia you can already see the different intent I have with communication. So motion is indicated through that as well. And you can see I'm a very hand talky type of person. Our body language and facial expression have a lot to do with how we are expressing ourselves as well. So how is communication affected by Parkinson's? And you can see I'm specifically using the word communication rather than just speech and language. Speech and language are very important, but it's the overall communication that is affected. So um, lots of different aspects can be affected by uh, Huntington's disease. Um, hyperkinetic dysarthria, which is uh, some imprecise movements of your tongue and lips and cheeks, and it's characterized by irrelevant or excessive involuntary movements um, that the person uses to speak. So this can be, this can have a result of a little bit of a harsh voice quality, sometimes a strained voice quality, some hypernasality, which you kind of hear me, I have hyponasality because I'm just getting over an illness, so my nasal cavity is a little bit affected, so I may sound like I can't say my M's and my N's properly because my nose is stuffed up. Um, but you may notice hypernasality, so excessive nasality. Some people find they have more of a, a breathy voice, so lots of breath in their voice, um, and variation in loudness that may be unpredictable. So I have here broken up in your slideshow some early and mid to late stages of, uh, Park, uh, I'm sorry, I will say Parkinson's disease sometimes, Huntington's disease. Um, I just did a presentation as well. Parkinson's, Huntington's disease um, that uh, look at the early stages. So we have that hyperkinetic dysarthria for sure. So speech rate, um, uh, some people will have more of a uh, uh, faster rate of speech for a couple of reasons. One reason may be they're trying to get out all they need to get out those different sentences in one breath because the respiratory rate is affected by Huntington's. Some people's voice quality, as I was saying before, strange, harsh voice may be affected. And you'll see in both early and mid to late stages, I have social communication there. So even a little bit of um, speech and language uh, disorder can affect somebody's confidence. So that means speaking one-on-one -on -one with people, your family and friends. That also means speaking with uh, strangers, so people at the grocery store, people outside of your um, communication bubbles. Uh, I really find that this is almost the number one issue I see with my patients with Huntington's disease is that social communication aspect, which if that is affected, affects your social isolation and affects your whole sense of self um, and uh, therefore affects your um, 
health in both mentally and physically. So that's really important to, to talk about. So the mid and late stages, you may notice some abnormal respiration. So again, big breaths sometimes, little breaths sometimes, feeling like you're running out of breath during conversation, um, some cognitive changes. So we do use a lot of cognition when we're speaking with other people, getting their intent when they're speaking, understanding when a question is being asked, understanding sarcasm and humor, um, and also just our ability to, to answer questions, um, how you, know, you may intend to uh, may be affected with cognitive changes as well. Let's see if I missed anything. Okay, so what can we do to help in Huntington's disease? So some speech strategies that may be employed by speech pathologists are to use shorter phrases. So if we use shorter phrases, we only need a little bit of a breath uh, to do those so we can be more predictable in what we're saying. Starting at the top of our breath, so I find sometimes with respiratory issues like in Huntington's, Huntington's disease, people will start when they're already out of breath and then talk like this and not have enough strength to actually gain the loudness and uh, everything needed to express what you really want to say. And over exaggerating your facial expressions, your voice, your prosody and intonation, and your body language as well. Something really important is setting up a really good communication environment. So I always share the, the short anecdotal story that I, I once had a patient with a neurodegenerative disease. And the patient's wife had said, I don't understand it. Every evening, I cannot get a word out of my husband. And they're distracted. I, I just, I have the lights on. Everything is great. Um, I have the TV off, radios off, good lighting. Everything's fantastic. We're face-to-face, -face, good communication environment. What we ended up discovering was every evening, they would put on the dishwasher. And that dishwasher sound was enough to be so distracting to the patient that they could not concentrate on the conversation. So just look for things in your environment. Um, you know, drafty windows is, is the, uh, I'm looking outside and it's snowing, so it's distracting me. Um, you know, is that a distraction that you may not be aware of? Does the furnace coming on distract in that communication environment? Some compensatory strategies that people may use in, uh, everything from early to later stages of Huntington's are things like memory aids. Um, is there a place where you always put your keys and when you get your keys, you make sure to say good morning to your spouse. Uh, some people will use an alphabet board when their speech and language are quite affected. So can you use an alphabet board where you point to the first letter, letter of the word to help your communication partner understand what you're saying? Do you use some things like AAC? So do you have a picture board of 12 different pictures that you use every morning during breakfast time so you can communicate to your communication partner that the meal is too hot, that you'd like some water, things like that. And your speech language pathologist would be able to uh, assist you in creating things like that. So early, you'll see under my partner training that early intervention is incredibly important. Your speech and swallowing may not be affected right now, but if you work on strategies such as the speech strategies, communication environments, compensatory strategies now, this will help you immensely in um, maintaining your uh, abilities for as long as possible. So, you know, so you continue to have choices and so that uh, you're supported in your communication strategies. It's very important too to have whoever is going to be communicating with you the most, whether it's be a spouse, a friend, um, some other family member to also be involved in therapy so they know what to do and how to best support you as well. All right, so we're going to switch to swallowing and we're going to look very briefly at the anatomy and physiology of swallowing. I bet you didn't think that you were going to look at uh, some bones and muscle structures today. Maybe you did. So here you can look at our uh, it's kind of if, if we were sliced in half, this is what our um, face and throat look like. 
So you can see that big nasal cavity, lots of room for resonance and sound comes from our nasal cavity. Um, you'll see our tongue is this giant muscle. Uh, we use our teeth, our upper and lower lips. And then we head down, um, as we go past our tongue, we see our pharynx, and people usually just call this your throat. My throat hurts, it's usually your pharynx is hurting. Um, we have that little tiny shelf at the bottom of the tongue, it's called the epiglottis. We'll get into why this is so important later. And then as you go past down, the, uh, past the epiglottis, you'll see that there's two kind of fleshy looking tubes. So that tube, near the front of the face is called the trachea and that is where only air should go in nothing else should go in the trachea air only and in the back there's that tiny tube and that's the esophagus so what you'll notice is that there's an area kind of near the epiglottis where it's only one tube and then it splits off and that's very important for what we're going to talk about Voluntary stages, so meaning that you're aware of them and you are controlling them, and two involuntary stages. So these two voluntary stages are the oral preparatory stage, so literally you bringing the spoon to your mouth, the oral stage, which we'll go over in detail, and then the involuntary are the pharyngeal and the esophageal stages. So we'll go over that in some detail. I'm going to probably play this video a few times while I'm talking. Um, so here we have a beautifully rendered 3D-ish 2D model of uh, how food is chewed up and swallowed in the mouth and the throat. So I talked a little bit about that oral preparatory stage, which is before the oral stage, where we are literally taking the spoon or the cup to our mouth um, prior to chewing. Then we have the oral phase. So food enters the cavity, we're chewing, mastication or chewing happens, and the bolus forms. And bolus is just a fancy word for spit plus uh, uh, food. So it creates this nice little mushy ball in order for our uh, body to swallow it. So as that mushy ball, that bolus is formed, our tongue raises, and I'll just play this again, our tongue raises at the front of our mouth and pushes that bolus to the back, oh, to the back of our mouth. There we go. So, so you can see the person chewing, chewing, chewing. So we're in the oral phase. Now that bolus is near the back of the tongue. Then our pharyngeal phase happens when the soft palate, the top, our little hangy ball, that uvula, kind of raises up, allows that food to head down. And we want to protect our airway. So lots of things happen to protect our airway. So food heads down, we don't want it to head into our airway. So our epiglottis, that little shelf moves down as you can see in the diagram. Our breathing stops, so we actually hold our breath. And our upper esophageal sphincter, so it's just a little sphincter at the top of our esophagus opens and food goes down the right way. That's in a typical swallow. After it leaves, our upper esophageal sphincter and goes down, it continues down our esophagus in the esophageal phase and heads down into our stomach. So here we have a video fluoroscopic swallowing study. Some people call it, used to call it a, a cookie swallow. And what it is, is a series of x-rays that make a video. So let's watch, and this is a typical swallow. There we go. So you'll see, spoon goes in mouth, person is chewing. Oh, and the food already goes down. So, so sorry, this isn't a, a solid, this is probably a liquid. So food goes in the mouth and if you blink, you'll miss it. Food goes to the back of the mouth and bam, the swallow happens. So this oral phase is about one second. And when that pharyngeal phase happens, it takes about two to three seconds for that bolus to reach our stomach. So it's very, very, very fast is what I'm trying to get at. All these different muscles used. 
So just want to touch on too that our airway is protected. I'll show this video again in, in three ways. So our airway is protected via that epiglottic deflection. So that epiglottis, and you can see it in this video, <laughs> barely, it's so fast, uh, covering our airway. Our laryngeal vestibule closure, so right above our vocal cords and the trachea squeezes shut and doesn't allow anything to come in. Um, our vocal cords close and we actually are holding our breath while we're swallowing in a normal swallow. So lots of uh, airway protection. Our body does not want anything to go down the wrong way. So dysphagia, what is dysphagia? Dysphagia is a reduction in function or impairment of the structures involved in swallowing. So we can have dysphagia actually in the, the pre-oral stage, the oral phase, pharyngeal stage, stage, and the esophageal stage. So our structures may be physically affected or as in Huntington's disease, may be neurologically affected. So the, the um, nerves telling your body what to do may be affected. And a big thing, especially in Huntington's disease, is dysphagia can happen with respiratory difficulties or um, irregular respirations, which definitely happens in Huntington's. So overall, how is, um, how is swallowing affected by Huntington's disease? And some of you may uh, have seen this in your own lives or with your partner as well. So with Korea, that irregular involuntary movement, that can happen in any stage of swallowing that makes it unpredictable. So, you know, if we take a small spoonful, we may accidentally take a large spoonful or a huge sip when we don't mean to, which can definitely uh, put your swallowing and your airway at risk. Um, movements such as maybe you're hyperflexing when you're taking a drink or food, where we're really overflexing our throat, which makes our trachea really open and susceptible to aspiration. Aspiration is when food or liquid go down into our trachea and could be in our lungs as well. That could cause uh, a pneumonia or an infection. Um, the next thing that, that may affect swallowing is apraxia, so our motor planning. So I like to use our motor planning example of if I'm trying to reach out and uh, grab a pen. So my body is telling me to extend my arm, open my hand, go down, pick up my pen and come back. If that motor planning or the sequencing is off, I could end up with my arm up here, I could end up with no pen in my hand. So that motor planning is very important in sequencing those events. And your swallow, as you can see, has both those voluntary stages and involuntary stages, which both can be very affected by apraxia. So if you are swallowing before holding your breath or something like that, that can definitely affect the safety of your swallowing. And remembering, I don't know if I said this before, there are over 50 muscle movements involved in a swallow. And as you saw how fast that swallow is, all those muscles are coordinating very, very quickly. Um, we also have dystonia. Um, which are involuntary muscle contractions that, that sometimes can happen. And if this is happening, you know, in our pharyngeal stage, the food and bolus may not be accurately going towards that esophagus where it should be going. Obviously, muscle weakness can happen in any stage. We're not chewing enough our food because our musculature is fatigued and weak, and we're having this bolus that isn't really a bolus, but food, particulates everywhere, and it's hard for our body to coordinate all those little tiny pieces of food into the right tube instead of our trachea. And of course, cognitive changes. So um, sometimes inability to see how much our volume while we're eating, um, you know, when we should stop, when we should start, maybe we have too much in our mouth. Some people find that they get pocketing uh, chipmunk cheeks while they're eating because of some, mus some uh, cognitive changes as well during swallowing. So if you are seeing a speech pathologist, or if you will be seeing a speech pathologist, um, you may be uh, doing one or several or all of these types of swallowing assessments. So there's the clinical swallowing exam, 
the video fluoroscopic swallowing study, and the fiber optic endoscopic examination of swallowing. You don't need to remember these, but I will briefly go over all of these just so you know a little bit about what to expect if you do go through one of these. So the clinical bedside swallowing exam looks at your cranial nerves. So these are the major nerves in your body. And for us, for speech pathologists and swallowing, we're looking from everything from the brain to the face to the throat and the respiratory system and how these um, cranial nerves are involved and how they're functioning right now and how that may affect swallowing. So we're trying to predict how your swallowing is affected by the functionality of your cranial nerves. During this exam, you'll be trying some food and liquid. I, If I'm going to somebody's house, I'll usually ask them to, to get different textures of their favorite food to see kind of what um, typically they'll have at dinner and how their swallowing is affected. You may have um, a hand, the speech pathologist's hand on your throat to see how your larynx or your voice box is moving because as we swallow, our voice box moves, moves up and forward in order to kind of protect that trachea and open up that upper esophageal sphincter, that UES in the back um, where food should go. We also do that video fluoroscopic swallowing study. That's the video I showed you before. That's a series of x-rays. It's an x-ray video. A lot of the times what I'll do is when we're finished the test, we'll be able to flip the screen around and you can actually see yourself chewing and swallowing, um, which people uh, either get a little bit freaked out with or absolutely love and want to keep watching it. Um, it's great to see the inside of your body and uh, what we're saying is happening and for you to actually see that because sometimes you don't feel that, especially during that involuntary muscle movement. It's hard to kind of um, wrap your brain around what's actually happening. So we add a little bit of barium, which is just contrast, um, and we visualize all the, the facial, oral structures, and even our esophagus while you're swallowing, and we watch it down all the way to your stomach. Uh, and you do not have to do any prep for this test. You don't need to be nothing by mouth. It's, you just come in and you eat a few things with barium in them. And the last one is the fiber endoscopic uh, evaluation, examination of swallowing or fees. And here we are using a little endoscope and put it through your, your nose and we're looking down at your throat to see how food and liquids are moving um, above your vocal folds. So I have a little video of that if you'd like to watch that. This is, a, this is fees, so the fiber optic endoscopic examination of swallowing. That happened so quickly. We'll watch it again. <laughs> oh, there we go. So right there, it, we're looking at the epiglottis and you'll see it when she swallows. So there's the epiglottis, that lovely shelf that protects our airway. And you can see below, you can see those nice white kind of triangular structures that we'll see them closely in a second. Those are your vocal folds. Oh, that's it. Okay. Let's watch it one more time. So we're going down through the nasal cavity, that giant, beautiful cavity. This is our pharynx, the back of our throat. And we see the, that curly Q thing, that's the epiglottis. And right below the epiglottis, we see our vocal cords. This is a little bit uncomfortable, but uh, they'll usually use kind of some numbing spray and uh, it'll be, it'll, it's a breeze. There you see her swallowing. There we go. Pretty cool, right? I think it's cool. Okay, I wanted to touch on medication and swallowing as well. Um, there are lots of different medications involved that can affect swallowing. So I just, I picked a few. So antidepressants um, 
can cause something called xerostomia or dry mouth, uh, which may interfere with swallowing by impairing your ability to make a really nice bolus. So as I said before, a bolus is saliva in food. We need saliva in order to swallow. So if you're, have you ever tried to swallow a really dry pill? It's very difficult. Our bodies need to kind of have a water slide with water, saliva, in order to swallow appropriately. Um, and some people find with xerostomia, which seems counterintuitive, that you actually have excess drooling. So some people will come to me and say, I don't understand. I'm drooling a lot, but I have a really dry mouth. So that'll be something that's uh, very typical as well with xerostomia. Um, Antipsychotic drugs, and I do have uh, some listed here as well, uh, may also affect swallowing, uh, dry mouth again, and affect um, the muscles of the face and tongue, which are involved in swallowing. Um, Anti-epileptic drugs or central nervous system medications um, can decrease your awareness of the voluntary muscle control that may affect swallowing, so that pre and oral stages um, may be affected as well by these medications. Okay, and so what can happen in swallowing with Huntington's disease? So I talked briefly about some of these things so that, that oral preparatory oral preparatory stage. So your posture may be affected. I find, again, some cachectic and hyperflexing uh, posture, which can open your airway, which you don't want during swallowing, um, rapid and impulsive food intake, reduced chewing or mastication, and reduced tongue movement, which again affects that bowl, that really important bolus formation. Um, also, we have an uncoordinated swallow at times. So as I was saying before, you're actually swallowing before holding your breath. You may have a delayed swallow. So food is trickling down towards your airway before you have a chance to do that swallow, which protects your airway. Some people find that they actually do choke and that they have coughing, coughing episodes. They have aspiration, which can cause you to cough. Um, you may swallow a lot of air, which causes vomiting and belching or could uh, uh, cause that as well. Um, some people, again, with those cognitive changes may be talking while eating, and while you're talking, your trachea is nice and open and your vocal cords are open, which could allow food and liquids to go down the wrong way. You could have laryngeal chorea, so just movement of your larynx, that voice box, and of your pharynx of your throat, which also can impact the safety of swallowing. So what can be done? So lots of things can be done. Um, sorry, just looking at the time. So we can do our diet modification. So lots of people have probably heard about making food softer, more easy to slide down your throat. Um, sometimes we will add moisteners to your food. So things like sauces, um, maybe we'll say, uh, have some liquid prior to eating and drinking. So we have that nice, wet slide that I always talk about when swallowing. Um, oops. We may uh, really have some cues for you to have a nice upright position. Um, a chin tuck might be something that your uh, uh, speech pathologist says is a good thing. Sometimes a chin tuck allows the food to keep kept in your mouth prior to swallowing for, um, so you can have more of a voluntary reaction to swallowing. Um, we may have some strategies uh, while you're eating, so maybe using some weighted utensils, and I'll go into this in a little bit more detail in the next slides. Um, some therapeutic exercises, which we'll go over, and I always will start the discussion of end of life requests as well. So a lot of people will ask about um, a feeding tube, and this is a personal choice, but you need to know about the risks and benefits of that. Um, it's not commonly used in Huntington's disease, but some do. Uh, some people find that it can be helpful. It doesn't mean that you can't eat by mouth. It just is a supplementary uh, nutritional intake. A lot of people with Huntington's will find that they, um, 
are full too quickly and therefore have unintentional weight loss. Um, and you can always have a feeding tube and take it back out if, if you so choose. But I always do start these conversations early so that you know the decision you've made early um, and can be informed before any cognitive changes uh, occur. So just briefly, this is um, what some types of food and liquid textures can be. So we can uh, help you with maybe thickening some liquids. Maybe that's something that's helpful for you, not always. Um, maybe we'll puree foods. Maybe that's a little bit easier so you don't have to masticate as much. Maybe softer foods. But this is just a little bit of a framework that's used in several hospitals and long-term care and retirement homes uh, to help you with um, food choices and food texture choices. I do wanna talk about oral hygiene is key. A healthy mouth means healthy lungs. So there are millions of bacteria in your mouth. So if you aspirate on something even kind of uh, neutral like water, if you're aspirating on water and the bacteria in your mouth, this can uh, give you a higher chance of getting an infection in your lungs like a pneumonia. So um, plaque actually redevelops within 24 hours of removal. So brushing those teeth twice a day is so important. Um, and high, there's a high concentration, so oral infection and systemic disease, there's a high concentration of pathogens in the oral cavity. Where, and the oral cavity has close proximity to the bloodstream. There's no skin layers to help us. Um, so with normal dental care, only a small amount of bacteria reach the bloodstream, but this bacteria increases with poor oral care. Toothbrushes are always better than mouth swabs. I say to my patients that I would rather you brush your teeth with water than use a toothbrush. Because if you're a little bit nervous about aspirating on toothpaste, taking some water or even saline water with, um, to help plaque removal is so much more important than anything else. And choosing an alcohol-free mouthwash. The reason why alcohol free is alcohol is very drying. We already talked about dry mouth. We want to avoid that. And dry mouth also increases the bacteria in your mouth. We'll talk about some general safe swallowing strategies. These good habits that we want to get into. So we want to have a good 90 degree posture while sitting in a chair, not in bed, not in a lazy boy, but sitting upright in a chair. We want our partners um, to be trained to help. So I will always suggest for partners to be trained in Heimlich maneuver or CPR, just in case something goes uh, wrong with the swallow, or the partner there to cue the person um, to you know wait between bites and sips until you've swallowed, until everything is clear from your mouth, um, wait for the next bout of food or liquid. Some people find weighted utensils really helpful um, for cueing their brain that they have a utensil in their hand uh, and sometimes helps with those involuntary movements to have something with a little bit of weight on it. Small sips, small bites, single sips, single bites. Um, some people with Huntington's find it more helpful to have smaller, more frequent meals to help with kind of that over volume of food and liquid. And learning good habits and having that really nice, good lighting environment, eating at the table, um, and ensuring uh, distractions are very limited. And of course, early intervention is key. So this is our last slide before our question period, which I think is good timing because I think we'll have about 10 minutes for questions and answers. So some swallowing and maneuvers that your speech pathologist may get you to try are an effortful swallow. So that just means thinking about squeezing everything, all your muscles. So making that pharyngeal stage more voluntary because we're thinking about squeezing. The more we squeeze and have effort in our swallow, the better our airway is protected as our larynx comes forward, closes our trachea and opens up our upper esophageal sphincter. We have um, some fancy names of the super and the super supraglottic swallow um, and the Mendelssohn. So, so essentially what these uh, swallowing maneuvers 
They can be used during eating and drinking, but they can also be used as exercises. Um, essentially what they are is allowing the food in your mouth to be there. We take a deep breath, we swallow, and then we <clears throat> have a cough afterwards. So it expels anything that might have, might have snuck into our airway and gives our body a chance to expel it rather than <clears throat> gasping for breath um, afterwards. Um, the Mendelssohn uh, maneuver is holding our larynx nice and up and squeeze. This takes a lot of practice while we're swallowing for as long as possible, again, to protect our airway for as long as possible and open our esophagus for as long as possible. And again, all caretakers, I would suggest to be trained in the Heimlich maneuver. So that's a quick overview of speech and communication and swallowing issues and some things we can do to help um, in Huntington's disease. And I am happy to take some questions. And I don't know, uh, Sherry, if you'd like me to have the seed questions up or um, my email up. Um, how about we just kind of kind of start? I have a couple of questions already that oh, great. Kind of okay. filtered through. But before we even get to the questions, I just want to say thank you so much for your presentation. Valuable information. And the, the videos were amazing. Perfect. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'm just going to reiterate what Shelly has written in the chat um, about if you have a question, you can raise your hand or you can um, articulate it in the chat box and be more than help, uh, more than happy to read those questions out. But to get kind of things started with the Q&A session, um, when would you when would, when would be the best time to have a speech and language pathologist, pathologist join your care team? Such a good idea uh, to have them join as soon as possible. So I would love for there to be a system where you would have a Huntington's disease care team. Um, the sooner you have a speech language pathologist, uh, the better. So I'll talk about for communication. Mm -hmm. So for communication, if... I couldn't have planned that better for communication and then there's a pause. We'll just wait for Olivia to join us. Early, you want to train your communication partner or whoever you're going to be communicating with on best strategies, how to create a good communication environment. You want to train them early. Um, those memory cues, like I briefly talked about, you want to start implementing them very early so that as cognitive changes happen, as speech and language and swallowing decrease, you have those strategies already nice and ingrained um, in your day to day life. And for swallowing, you want to start with those strengthening, um, I shouldn't call them strengthening exercises, those uh, healthy um, habits. So, good posture, good swallowing environment um, and exercises that help with coordinating your swallow, which is kind of what I was talking about before. So starting those early gets your brain to rewire how to do things uh, in order to pre prepare for the neurodegenerative um, aspect of Huntington's. So right away. <laughs> right away. Well, um, speaking of right away, while we're waiting for speech language pathologists to kind of join the, the care team for our uh, for our family members and friends, etc. What would what would a like a, a communication board look like if you are, hmm. you know, how can we create one at home waiting for, you know, folks like yourself to be able to join our team? Such a great question. And wow, that's such a great question. Um, so communication board, let's just again use that breakfast example. Mm -hmm. So let's say from in our household, we have about five different breakfasts that we cycle through. So could you have a picture, you can just Google it, or you can take a picture with your phone um, and print out those pictures and literally stick it on a piece of paper and have your five different choices for breakfast. And then things that you would talk about during breakfast. So everything from needs as well as wants. So needs, too hot, too cold. Um, maybe have your different drinks, pictures of your different drinks that you would usually have. Uh, would you have an, a fit, I'm finished, or I want more as well. You could even just write those out. Um, do you talk about the weather every morning or weather news or what your day is gonna be? Maybe you can have three pictures, 
that you can choose what you'd like to talk about during breakfast. And that can be one board specifically for breakfast. And you, and you can think of things, you know, going to the bank, what you may talk about at the bank, um, and having different boards like that for, uh, help, for it being helpful for you to practice um, early on. Oh, That's what a question. great idea. What a great idea. Thank you for that. We do have a question from our from our crowd. Shelly, would you like to ask, ask your question? I would. Thank you. Um, thanks for such an amazing session. That was really informative and we've got some really great feedback from it. Um, you talked about the picture boards and um, just with the Korea and uh, the ability for them to direct to, to those pictures. Are there any other modalities that um, might be helpful? I know um, eye gaze or, or anything like that um, with the Korea might also be an issue. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we have, uh, I know here in Southern Ontario, we have the Communication Technology Clinic. Those speech pathologists and clinicians um, actually prescribe to you different technological AAC devices that are specific for your situation. So that would be a really good way to, um, you know, get specifically what you need. In terms of the picture boards, some people find it helpful to do just a yes and a no that are larger uh, so they can go either yes or no. Again, this would take a lot of training on the communication partner to, in order to ask yes, no questions. Communication partners are also key in um, asking for choices. So is the communication partner trained on how to do supported communication. So again, let's say it's breakfast and the Korea is, has gotten to a point where pointing to specific pictures is not possible. The communication partner could write down two choices. So do you want oatmeal? Do you want Cheerios? Have that on a big piece of paper, the person looks down or up and whatever communication is established, it can be used with that. That's a great question. So we sometimes even have just sides of the table for choices. If it's left or right. Sometimes we have up and down for those larger movements that make it more um, obvious which choice they're having as well. That's a really good question, Shelley. Really good question. Thank you so much for that. I, I'm just cognizant of the time and I think I can squeeze one more little question in there. Sure. Um, I was just wondering, I'm, as you know, as I introduced myself, I'm one of the, um, the RCD from Eastern Ontario, and I'm all about building uh, resource toolboxes, takeaways, etc. What would you recommend as some of the tools that I would add to my toolbox from your presentation? So as a, as a professional talking with um, people with Parkinson's or with uh, Huntington's disease, or sorry, yeah. can you clarify? For, for anybody that's on our call, if, if when they work with our RCDs and our team, we always mm. love to be able to, you know, bring resources to them and share. What are some of the things that, that mm. you'd like for us to take away from your presentation to help build our individual, you know, toolboxes? Oh, my goodness. Everything from, um, you know, the advice in terms of early intervention, mm -hmm. um, in terms of being aware of different diet textures and what may be coming down the line. I really like specifically the um, pamphlet. I'm sure that the Canadian Huntington Society has one as well, but there's an American Huntington Society that has a pamphlet for speech and swallowing, which actually some of this presentation is from. I have the link at the back uh here um fantastic takeaway to have in your toolbox to give out to every patient gives kind of early mid late stages what to affect uh what to expect and what to do um and i i think you know reiterating environments are so key for both communication and swallowing um to make them safe and partner training early intervention is so so key in all of this. And if you ever need help in finding a speech language pathologist, um, ask your family doctor to refer to community care as early as possible. Don't mm -hmm. wait, be an advocate for yourself. Thank you so much. So I'm hearing early intervention. I'm hearing there's lots of resources on both our website and, and um, our Amen. partners. And yes. with regards to, you know, ask, ask and advocate and you'll be able to find those pieces. So thank you yes. so much. Uh, yes, I, thank think, you. I think that would wrap up. I don't see anybody else's hand up and I'm just looking at the time. So um, 
I will wrap up this session of our speech and language uh, pathologist piece. And I just wanted to say thank you again, Olivia. Fantastic information. Thank you for sharing all those creative ideas, uh, as well as with the uh, the videos. We're so grateful for you to, to be making the, and carving out the time for us today to join our conference this weekend. So thank you again. And thank you for everyone who supported the thank chat box and the uh, and for Shelly for, for the questions, etc. This is what makes a great conference. We're going to dedicate the next few minutes um, to uh, for a few more of our national awards. So following that, there will be a break, and then you'll have the opportunity to visit our virtual exhibitor booths. There's so much great information out there on our on our platform. Our next round of programming will be around 345. So bear with me, it'll just take a moment and I'll be able to share the video of our national awards. <laughs> 